Hello everyone, my name is Preston Dennett and welcome to a new episode of UFOs and the Paranormal. Today's episode I call Six Strange Cases of Humanoids in New York State. Sightings are very interesting, but I think far more interesting are cases in which people see humanoids face to face and or are taken on board. Of course these cases have been taking place for many decades. Uh, still continuing pretty much to the present day, and, as we know, occurring all over the world. But in this episode, I decided to limit the cases that I'm presenting here to New York State. I've studied the accounts in this state while doing research for a book, and I was surprised to find how many cases there are. It's well over the hundreds. It's probably closer to thousands, if not tens of thousands, or even hundreds of thousands. There was a lot of cases to choose from, but I decided to pick six that I think were particularly unique, had some interesting features that I think reveal something about the extraterrestrial presence on our planet, have something to say about how we interact with the extraterrestrials, uh, have unusual features to them, or are really credible, having multiple witnesses and or physical evidence, and have pronounced differences between each case, and also have taken place over a period of decades. So again, there are six cases, and I'd like to present each of these to you, and you can decide for yourself what this has to say about the UFO phenomenon. So let's get started with case one, which I call Implanted by Aliens. This took place in Lanzenburg, New York in 1955 to a gentleman by the name of Richard Price. Again, the year was 1955 and Richard Price, who was only eight years old, and his friend were playing on the street near his home on 10th Avenue. And again, this is in Lansingburg, New York. They both heard this weird sound, similar, they said, to an approaching train, kind of a whistling sound. Now, Richard's friend became frightened and ran away, but he, however, became curious and started running around the neighborhood searching for the source of this sound. So, after several minutes, he followed this sound to the Oakwood Cemetery. Find, I found this quite interesting because I've actually documented many cases of UFOs hovering over cemeteries. I did a previous episode on such encounters. But with Richard Price, the first thing he noticed upon reaching the Oakwood Cemetery and the source of this sound was two strange figures who were both about his height, quite short, he said they had dark, slanted eyes and wore what appeared to be helmets and uniforms. And realizing they were not human, he became quite frightened and turned and tried to run away. But he wasn't able to do this, and instead he felt himself drawn towards the beings who actually escorted him onto a 150-foot-wide disc-shaped craft that sat in a clearing in the woods next to the Oakwood Cemetery. The beings elevated Price up into the craft, and once inside, he said he was undressed by the beings and placed on an examination table. Two of the other beings joined the group, and they all began to physically examine him. He said they actually spoke verbally in a strange language, which he compared to stereo equipment being played too slowly. He watched a viewing screen on the wall as the beings placed a small, apparently an implant, in a very private and sensitive portion of his body. Now one of the beings spoke to him at this point and warned him to never try to remove this implant or he could die. Strangely, Richard was not frightened by this at the time. And after this apparent procedure in which an implant was allegedly placed in his body, he was dressed back in his clothes. The beings then handed him a piece of parchment-like material with what looked like, Richard said, an alien alphabet full of strange 
geometric symbols. At this point they showed him images on a view screen of other craft in what he likened to a virtual reality display. In some reports on this case, because this case has been reported widely, he says he saw what looked like a weird city on what might be another planet. And that was pretty much the end of the experience. Afterwards, he was escorted off the craft and back to the same location in the Oakwood Cemetery. He immediately ran home and told his father what happened. Unfortunately, his father did not believe him and assumed that Richard was just having a vivid imagination. And he learned pretty early on to keep quiet. He did later tell his grandmother, who believed him, but she also said that he should be careful about revealing his story to people. Unfortunately, the pressure to tell other people became too strong, and at age 16, while in high school, Richard decided to share his story with a classmate. And this turned out not to be a good idea. Word spread fast about Richard's encounters. They started ridiculing him, calling him the spaceman, and he felt himself becoming quite isolated. And as Richard says, the experience itself wasn't bad, but the after effects were bad. So this is something we do see with a lot of encounters. And this story followed him into college and things got much worse. In college, uh, this story spread like wildfire and it was causing all kinds of disruptions. So he was called in to see the principal. And the principal decided that Richard, based only on this story, was mentally unbalanced and sent him to see a psychologist. And the psychologist actually agreed with the principal and admitted Richard into a psychiatric hospital. And things went downhill from here. He was heavily medicated, told that he was insane, and they would not release him. They would only release him if he agreed to say that this incident never happened. And realizing he was not going to get out otherwise, Richard agreed to tell them that there was no such UFO incident. However, in his heart, he still believed that this did happen. And once he got out, he just didn't talk about it at that point. He did keep this piece of apparent alien parchment for a while, but at one point, as happens in many other cases, it mysteriously disappeared, and although he searched for it, he could never find it. And it was years later, in 1981, that he decided to go to the doctor, because where this implant had been placed on his body, uh, he started to feel this odd lump. And the doctor examined it, and he was puzzled by it and by the swelling, but recommended that they take no action because there did not appear to be any damage there, uh, no pain, and as long as it didn't change, they decided to just leave it alone. And Richard's condition remained stable for years, actually, for eight years until 1989, when this object started to protrude more than usual. And it was shortly later, it popped out with a feeling, Richard said, like an electrical shock. And this is where the story takes a very interesting turn. Richard actually saved this object, this apparent ET implant, and gave it to Dr. David Pritchard. Pritchard is not only a UFO researcher, but a teacher of physics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, a very respected school. And he conducted this alleged alien implant to a scientific analysis using a scanning electron microscope and a secondary iron mass spectrometer. And it showed some unusual properties for sure. Pritchard determined that this was, to his surprise, actually organic material composed mostly of, quote, carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. Uh, plus other what appeared to be normal earthly substances. It did appear to have a core of translucent material with a collagen sheen uh, encasing it, apparently as a result 
of having been inside Richard's body for an extended period of time. But even more interesting, projecting up from the object were three little appendages 18 microns wide, or approximately one quarter the width of a human hair. Uh, there was some nitrogen in this uh, apparent implant as well, but less than Pritchard expected. And what exactly it was could not be determined. However, Richard himself is certain that this was in fact placed there by the ETs. And at a 1997 conference in Albany, New York, he revealed that all these years later, this early childhood experience continued to affect his life. Uh, afterwards, he said he found it very difficult to concentrate in school. He experienced considerable emotional distress. He did get married, but due to this encounter, he says, it contributed to his divorce. So yeah, this had a profound effect on his life. Price is considering writing a book about his experiences, but as far as I know, he has not done so yet. But it's definitely an important case. I like this case because it has physical evidence. And uh, another thing that's really interesting to me about it was how deeply and profoundly it affected the witness, Richard Price. It's really quite a remarkable case, and again, one of the first cases ever involving an alien implant that was actually analyzed scientifically. So a very important case. And now we move to case two, which I call a UFO lands on Main Street. And this took place in Churchville, New York, on July 31st, 1967. And the main witness is a gentleman by the name of Sidney Zipkin. This next case occurred on July 31st, 1967. And again, the main witness is a gentleman by the name of Sidney Zipkin. He was 50 years old when this occurred. And what's interesting about this case is that some people are more likely than others to encounter UFOs. People such as security guards, night watchmen, pilots, police officers, and other people whose jobs entail them staying outside late at night. And this is a case in point. Sidney Zipkin was a security guard. And on the evening of July 31st, 1967, he was driving through the Churchville Park parking lot. This is just off Main Street in Churchville. And he says he saw a 50-foot wide cigar-shaped object drop out of the sky and land softly on the cement. He brought his truck to a stop and he approached within 100 feet of this strange object and aimed his headlights directly at it. And according to Sidney Zipkin, this object was dark in color, roundish in the center, and had green lights on the bottom of it. In some of the reports, uh, this object was described as being Saturn-shaped. But as he's watching this object, he says, and I quote, two dwarfs dressed in shiny black uniforms uh, end quote, rushed by his truck and ran into the UFO. And that caught him quite by surprise. And shortly later, this object took off straight up and disappeared. And that, you'd think, would be the end of this report, but it's not. The National Investigative Committee for Aerial Phenomena assigned a couple of investigators to the case and after interviewing him, they said that he appeared to be entirely truthful and he remained steadfast in his report. His story did not change and a further investigation revealed that there were apparently several other witnesses. It was later learned that four police officers, two sheriffs, and two deputies in separate locations saw UFOs in that area about four hours after Zipkin reported seeing this object landed in the parking lot. And further research revealed that there were other witnesses, at least eight others. One who was at a college 
and seven other witnesses who saw a UFO in the sky that evening. Some of these witnesses include Daniel Mullen, Ronald Phillips, Arnold Johnson, Ronald Bump, and Bruce Kenny. So these witnesses are actually named, and I think that does lend credence to Sidney Zipkin's encounter. Uh, Sidney, however, did have a difficult time with this. It did appear in newspapers, and there were people who were clearly skeptical. As Sidney says, in his own words, Nobody believes me, even my brother. I always thought it was a bunch of garbage myself, but when you see one yourself, it's not a laughing matter. It's a pretty serious, it's a pretty serious thing. There's a planet or something out there, and the government ought to look into it. And he later said, you can laugh at what I'm telling you. In fact, I used to laugh myself when people said they saw these things. But I saw this with my own eyes, and I swear to God as a witness that I saw what I saw. And yes, Sidney Zipkin does have other people who believe he's telling the truth. In fact, his superior, his boss for his job, um, said that Zipkin came running up to him. Uh, his superior's name is Clarence Johnson. And Clarence Johnson said that Sidney Zipkin was, quote, white as a ghost. And another person who verifies Sidney's story is Alvin Grant, the county parks director, who said that Sidney Zipkin was a reliable employee and that his terrified condition testified to the truth of his story. However, there was a weird aftermath to this case. One week later, Sidney Zipkin was fired from his job. Apparently, this case brought a lot of attention to him, and it was revealed that Sidney did have a prior criminal record for petty theft and uh, a few other things. Uh, but for whatever reason, whether it was this incident or not, Sidney Zipkin lost his job. But what's interesting about this case is this UFO landed on Main Street in a very heavily populated case, and it has many other witnesses. So while this case does have some unusual and controversial elements to it, it appears to be entirely genuine and is well corroborated by numerous other witnesses who saw UFOs in that area at that time. So a good case. And now let's move to case three, the New Field New York UFO flap. And this took place in 1967. It involves actually many hundreds of witnesses, but initially began with just two witnesses, two young boys by the names of Donald Chizer and Pat Crozier. It was around 9.30 p.m. on October 24, 1967, when two youngsters, John Donald Chizer, who was 13 years old, and his friend, Pat Crozier, who was 10 years old, were both outside their homes in Newfield, New York, when they saw a bright glowing object hovering at a very low altitude. They estimate about 130 feet overhead. They said it was round, it had a cupola on top, and what appeared to be a little antenna type device. They said a box-like protrusion um, stuck out from the bottom of the craft and that this protrusion had red, green, and white lights on it. The rim of the craft itself had squarish red and white lights. So as they're watching this thing and trying to determine what it is, this object suddenly tilts towards them. And at this point, Donald and Pat could see that there were two large square portholes separated by a single bar. They said the craft appeared to have strange lettering or symbols along the bottoms of the portholes. And inside, through these portholes, they could see two humanoid finger figures sitting down in small seats, operating control panels that were filled with small lights and knobs. These beings were quite short. They appeared to be about five and a half feet tall 
and had a very strange appearance, brown skin that looked like it had a weird bumpy texture. And they watched this for quite some time, about two minutes. Finally, this object tilted up at the rear, became very bright, then assumed a horizontal position and disappeared, they said, quote, like a puff of wind. So it was quite an amazing case, and it was the next night, actually, that they went outside again, and this same craft, or one just like it, appeared again. This time they had walkie-talkies, and they said that when this craft appeared, and again it was quite low, their walkie-talkies malfunctioned, and dogs were barking nearby, and looking around they saw that there was another one of these craft. So this started to create a little bit of buzz around town, especially because the night before the boys' encounter, their first encounter, a gentleman by the name of Stanley Orr said he saw weird lights. And over the next week, activity ramped up to an incredible degree. And by October 30th, more than, get this, 100 sightings were made by local residents. And this became known as the, quote, Great Ithaca Flap. This appeared in newspapers. Uh, the Air Force sent an investigator and said it was airplanes. Astronomers analyzed these uh, reports and could not come up with an explanation. There was a student who says that he set off a version of what we know of as sky lanterns and that this might have contributed to at least some of the sightings but it certainly does not explain what Donald Chizer and Pat Crozier saw, which was a solid metallic looking craft with lights and portholes and ETs looking down at them. It's quite a case. It's a very interesting case with so many witnesses, animal effects, what appear to be electromagnetic effects, and a very pronounced wave of UFO activity that went on for at least one month. So an important case I think. And now we move to case four. They were not human. And this took place primarily in the town of Millerton. It does involve multiple witnesses who prefer to remain anonymous and it took place in the year of 1972 and this one is quite a doozy of a case. It was late on the evening of June 10, 1972 when an anonymous nurse was driving with her 65 year old mother and her infant son outside of Millerton, New York along a street called Coleman Station Road when they noticed a multicolored lighted object flashing very high in the sky ahead of them. They both assumed it was a plane when, without warning, it dropped down out of the sky at a tremendous rate of speed. They assumed at this point that this was a plane about to crash right in front of them when suddenly it stopped and hovered only a few hundred feet away, and only then did they realize it was not a plane. As the witness says in her own words, and I quote, it made a very soft, quiet humming sound as it hovered just above the trees. I was terrified. My hands were shaking as I clenched the steering wheel. I was so afraid for all of us in the car, especially my infant son asleep in his car seat in the back. The object was absolutely huge, just tremendous in size. It was saucer-shaped with some sort of dome, Around the entire dome, we could clearly see a panel of windows. What we saw through the windows gave me nightmares for many years. There were beings looking out at us. They were not human in appearance. I counted five, but my mother swore she counted six. I do not know what they were, but they were not human beings. From our view, we could see large oval black eyes with big bug-like heads attached to what appeared to be very thin necks with long thin arms. My mother and I both thought that they appeared gray in color. 
As they watched the object, it sent down a blue-white beam of light from underneath the craft, and this beam actually struck their car, illuminating the interior like daylight. And in fact, the light was so bright that both women were forced to cover their eyes. And it stayed like that for about a full minute or even two minutes, at which point the beam of light retracted. At this point, the craft started to move, Still afraid, the nurse pressed her foot to the accelerator and raced home. But to her shock, this UFO actually followed them, or rather kept in front of them, in the sky at just above treetop level. And this object remained in view the entire trip home. She drove off Coleman Station Road, got onto Route 22, drove for another five minutes, and took a left onto McGee Hill Road, where she lived. And she quickly drove the rest of the distance home, and they all ran inside. This object was still there. They could hear the faint whining of the object as it finally moved away. And as the witness says, I don't think either one of us actually slept that night. I was still shaking the next morning. It was such a traumatic experience for us. And here's another very interesting aspect to this story. Mind you, there are already two witnesses. But the nurse was so upset by what she had seen that the next morning she phoned the civil defense authorities who told her that they had received, quote, thousands of calls. Now, most of the callers were reporting distant objects, but a few, they told her, involved close-up encounters. And as the nurse says in her own words, I have told hundreds of people about that evening, and I will continue to tell everyone that asks until I am no longer able to. There is life outside our little world. I don't understand the whys and hows, but I know there is. I have seen it. Quite a dramatic case. So this case I thought was interesting because it followed them for so long and it affected them so profoundly. It does not appear to be an actual contact case. I don't think we can rule out that they were taken on board or not, but it does not appear that they were. But it's really quite an amazing description of a really remarkable and prolonged UFO event involving humanoids. And that's why I wanted to include it in today's episode. And now we move to case number five. I am not afraid of them. And this involves a witness by the name of Monique Driscoll, who was a witness to the very famous Hudson Valley UFO wave. And she's not only a witness to a UFO sighting, but apparently an actual onboard encounter. This took place in 1983. And I think it's a very important case. From 1982 to 1986, there was a very intense wave of sightings over the Hudson Valley area of New York State. This actually was well beyond just Hudson Valley, appearing in Connecticut and some neighboring areas as well. And it was during this wave of sightings that the number of onboard UFO encounters in this area rose sharply, at least tripling in number. And it was on February 26, 1983, that a woman by the name of Monique O'Driscoll and her daughter actually witnessed this Hudson Valley UFO triangle. When she saw it, Monique actually sent out a mental message to the UFO saying, Don't go! And to her amazement, it appeared to respond to her thoughts and approached much more closely. And here's where the story gets even stranger. Two months later, in April of 1983, she was walking her dog outside her home in Lake Carmel, New York, when she saw strange lights hovering nearby. And she returned home, thinking that she had just seen the UFO again and had a very close-up sighting. But to her shock and puzzlement, she discovered that it was now an hour later than it should have been. 
and realizing that this could mean that she had actually had a more extensive encounter, she agreed to undergo hypnosis with the famed UFO researcher Bud Hopkins. So Bud Hopkins hypnotically regressed her to the time of this incident, and to her amazement, she recalled that she was walking her dog outside, and the next moment, she found herself on board this craft. Apparently on board this craft, she was lying on her back in a small, round room that looked like it was covered with computer panels. She was being physically examined by, she said, little people with big, bald heads. They placed a weird, small, silver instrument on her chest, which vibrated. And despite the unusual nature of this experience, Monique says she remade, remained entirely calm throughout. As she says, and I quote, I am not afraid of them. Right now, I feel restful. So this was a huge wave of activity in this area at that time. There's actually a book about it written by Philip Imbrogno, uh, J. Allen Hynek, and Bob Pratt, and uh, it's a very interesting book. Philip Imbrogno actually spoke with Bud Hopkins about the reasons for this wave of sightings and why were they there? And Bud Hopkins told him simply, they are looking for people. At the time, Philip Imbrogno says he was really not convinced about the reality of abduction claims, but as he says, and I quote, I soon changed my mind when I discovered that over 82% of all the abduction cases I looked into were people who had been scanned previously by the UFO's white light. So that appeared to be true in Monique's case because she had mentally called out to this UFO and it approached her much more closely. And it was just two months later that she found herself having an onboard UFO encounter. So that's just one of many, many onboard UFO encounters which took place during the Hudson Valley UFO wave. And I like that case because it involves a witness who allowed her real name to be used, who seems quite credible, who drew illustrations of the craft that she saw, and also had no fear of her encounters. So it's an interesting case to say the least. And now we move to the last case in today's show, which I call Case 6, The Group Abductions. This took place in Saugerties, New York, actually over a period of several years, but it was primarily in September of 1989 when a group of friends began to experience abductions or onboard encounters together. Uh, encounters involving multiple witnesses being taken all at once are relatively rare in the literature. So this case is, I think, unusual in that regard, involving four or five witnesses, all of whom corroborate each other's story. It was Labor Day weekend in September 1989 when Farmingdale resident Curtis Walton, who was a store manager, and his friend James Lafonte, a messenger from Merrick, and several other friends decided that they would spend a weekend in a semi-remote area in Saugerties, New York. One of them had a trailer there, and they ended up spending many weekends there. And what was supposed to be a fun holiday on this occasion, however, turned out to be one of the strangest weekends of their lives. These friends, Curtis Walton, James LaFonte, and several others, including Brian Leisure, uh, Paul Cecere, and their friend Petra, all found themselves having an incredible experience. They had gone to bed and in the middle of the night, the trailer lit up with this really bright light. And uh, that's all they really remembered. Uh, but this happened many, many times. 
and after several instances of this sort of thing, they realized something very strange was happening, and they ended up going under hypnosis. Uh, they found a researcher who agreed to regress them, and under hypnotic regression, they found that they were being regularly taken on board. It was this one incident in September of 1989 that really woke them up to it, but it happened many times. As James LaFonte says uh, during one of his hypnotic regressions, I'm on a table. They have big eyes. Their skins look molded. And uh, after recalling being taken on board and mostly physically examined, he said other things happened. He found that they would be grouped together and they would sometimes be put in intimate situations, he said. And uh, as he says, they would take us into the room and start doing medical experiments. And sometimes there would be two or three of us in the same room. In the course of four years, I believe we were abducted about 60 times. Um, it was always seemed to follow the same pattern. The trailer would light up and they couldn't move. Other times they found themselves being led out of the trailer by grays and led to a certain field not far from the trailer, and it was there that they were taken on board. Not surprisingly, James LaFonte says that he recalled having experiences as a very little kid. As he says, ever since I was a child, I used to wake up and I used to see white lights and shadowy figures. So as an adult with, during this experience in this trailer, uh, he saw his friends also on board the UFO, Curtis Walton, Brian Leisure, Paul Cecere, and Petra. And not only did he recall seeing them, they recalled seeing him. James says, and I quote, I do know that they need our genes to propagate their own species. So he thinks ultimately the reason for these onboard experiences had to do with genetics. Curtis Walton and the others also went under hypnosis, and according to Curtis, and I quote, We were just going up there for fun, but as it turns out, week by week, we were all being abducted as a group. I would see James across the room and the same thing being done to him. Curtis also remembered not only the trailer lighting up, but sometimes being led out of the trailer. And he says he had uh, reproductive material removed from him on several occasions. And this is verified by their other friends. Brian Leisure says that, quote, When I was on the ship, I remember seeing James and Petra. And Brian, like the other witnesses, also remembers having encounters as a little kid. As he says, When I was a little kid, I guess I could call them like shadow people, because they used to come out of the shadows. And the shadows would come alive, and then they'd be these little, small guys. And Petra also agrees, as she says, When I was younger... I remember an alien looking through the windows, being watched, a feeling of being watched all the time. James and Kurt saw me on the UFOs. So James says that he remembers seeing them throughout the years, not only as adults, but as little kids. And all of them remembered being on this craft. So again, this appears to be not only a single group onboard experience, but many and that makes it quite unusual. As you can see, a well-verified case. They did all appear on the program sightings several years ago and bravely stepped forward and talked about what they had seen. So I think, yeah, it's an important case. Those are the six cases I wanted to present to you today. And I think you'll agree, they certainly are interesting and unique and have something to say about the nature of the UFO phenomenon. I did present them all, along with many others, in my book, UFOs Over New York, A True History of Extraterrestrial Encounters in the Empire State. 
And again, these are just <laughs> the tip of the iceberg. There are so many more cases that I could have presented. But this one, I think, does give you a fair cross-section of what it's like to encounter humanoids. And absolutely, these are strange cases. So, once again, I want to thank you very much for watching. I truly appreciate it. And until next time, keep searching for answers, keep asking questions, and most important, keep having fun.